don't let a toxic work environment harm your employees and your business. In the next fireside chat, Arif Aziz, CHRO, DHO, and Devjani Roy, CHRO, Mind Your Fleet will discuss on how to spot toxic work culture and what to do about it. Good afternoon and hi, Arif. Hi, Devjani. Nice to see you. And how's the sunny day treating you today? Wonderful. I think um, it's been a wonderful day and a great uh, positive change from what we have seen for last many weeks. Yeah, and thank God for that because at least that helps us come and discuss issues like we are going to do in a better uh, frame of mind. Uh, so, Arif, today we're going to be talking about you know toxic workspaces. Um, and uh, that, I think, is a very, very topical item today anyways. Um, you know, what does it do for us, especially HR folks? What does it do for the culture of the organization? Uh, what, what kind of things do we look out for in terms of when we say toxic workspaces? Is it about people calling in ill? Is it about narcissists kind of leadership styles? Is it about too much of noise without a lot of substance? Uh, is it about people not being motivated around the corners to really give their maximum? Uh, so there, there could be multiple reasons what we uh, sort of call out uh, as toxic workspaces. But then once it is in place, it uh, does pull down the morale and brings about a lack of productivity in the system. Um, how would you want to react to that? Have you had ex uh, examples to quote from your own uh, experience? Yeah, and I completely agree with you there, Johnny, as in at the end, uh, you know, if a workplace is toxic, it impacts the productivity. But I think there are many other signs, as you said. It's about people calling in ill, not committed to what they are doing. But there are three, four things I really look for, and which is which has been my learning over the years, that if you see these signs, it basically says that there are challenges. Um, the first one, um, which I have seen, is if all issues are coming to you as a leader, mm -hmm. that means there is a fundamental problem in that team. That and there are issues which are boiling down. People are not having a conversations, not resolving, and everything comes to a leader. So that's one sign which I have seen uh, um, gives you an indicator that something is wrong. The other one, which I think is um, is an easy one to see, but sometimes you don't realize. We think it's about individual style. It's how much people are participating in conversations of importance. They could be topics of importance related to work. But they could also be just a simple conversation about the work environment, but it's important. If people are not participating and they're avoiding, um, it really means that something is going wrong at the workplace and, you know, the environment is not really right. I would say the last one, and which is an important one, if everyone is nice to each other and there is no space for constructive conflict, there is a problem. Uh, because as leaders, sometimes we see what we see. What we are not seeing is what is hidden behind, uh, which will come out uh, at a later point in time when the environment is really destroyed. So I think if you're seeing that there is no constructive conflict, people are not challenging each other, and they're just being nice in front of you as a leader, there's something really wrong. So I, I would say these are the three things which I use, and I completely agree if you let the environment continue. At the end of it, it starts impacting output, motivation, engagement, and really destroys the culture. Fantastic. And that's absolutely bang on on the point. And uh, would you also agree, Arif, that in such an environment where already there are signals existing which are telling you that something is wrong, uh, uh, you know, around the corner, what role does communication really play in that? Do managers have to look out for the right kind of communication placed at the right time, usage of the right language, the tonality, the words being used? Because sometimes communication can make or break such situations. Uh, and if not handled properly, uh, and that's my experience from my, uh, you know, 20 plus years of corporate life, I found the wrong kind of communication positioned in the wrong manner has pulled down a lot of uh, good workspaces. What about your views on that? I completely agree, Devjani. I think it's a lot, it's a lot, not just about tonality messaging, but it's also the channels one is using. Are you creating enough two-way channels of communication to really get a pulse? And, you know, uh, it's very simple for one to say, oh, are you doing round tables or skip level meetings? But guess what? They're not the only platform. They're not the only channels for you to get. You have to also have informal connect with people. Yes. One also needs to really look at, uh, you know, some large scale interventions which are anonymous, you know, the traditional employee service. 
But I would say there are multiple channels of communication, multiple two ways, in addition to setting the right context and messaging, which is important. So net net, what you say is you've got to put a pulse on every channel and every source so that you don't miss out on any of these signals coming from some place. It's lovely. Uh, you know, um, uh, the other experience that I have personally, um, you know, seen as well as um, I've heard it from a lot of my fraternity colleagues is that when toxicity enters a workplace, there is a segment of the workforce which is more, uh, you know, I, I would say more prone to be affected by the negativity which is doing the rounds rather than those who come with an inherent strength of pushback. So, you know, there will always be in your workforce people who are, you know, some, some uh, you know, who are introverts, who don't speak so much, who could be uh, individual contributors, very good at their work, but people who are not, you know, vociferous or don't typically come and be a part of a large group. Uh, how would you want to ensure that, you know, such a group, such a good group of people who are productive and do a good days of work otherwise, don't get so badly affected that they start breaking down immediately when the toxicity sets in. Uh, it's a genuine fear. Um, a, a lot of workplaces do suffer from it. So I'd like to hear your views on that. Oh, it's a great question, Devjani. And this is the biggest worry one has, right? Because there are some people who are inherent resilient and they can deal with the situation. They can create toxicity, negativity, but deal with it also. Yes. And there are some people who are very sensitive and um, it can impact them. You know, there are many things. You know, uh, one needs to have all the platforms, right? Speak up channels and all of that. But let me talk about two or three things which I think are, uh, for me personally, have worked well. One is, as a leader, one needs to come out a little vulnerable sometimes and be authentic in front of people. See, when you are vulnerable and you are able to express your concerns, your challenges as a leader or as someone who's dealing with a tough situation, the people who will connect the most with you are the people who are similar in similar situations, who are very sensitive. And the level of trust one can build as a leader would be so powerful that if they are facing a similar situation, their ability to come across, connect, express will be not high. The other thing which I have also realized that uh, solution doesn't lie as a leader only with you. It's also a lot about the environment. And so it's important for us to know our people. And when we get to know our people, we can figure out where are those some, some of those networks. Mm. If there is someone who has a great relationship or personal relationship with someone else, mm. you can use these individuals to nudge each other and help as well. So the world of you know manager being at the center and all employees connected to the manager and that's how the organization works, it's gone. It's about the network of the team. So if one can strengthen that network, um, even if there are some bonds which are weak, the rest of them will pull the network forward. So I would I say that's, that's, a, that's a fabulous point because what you just outlined is the new uh, you know, matrix organization, not in terms of the hierarchies, which has been in place for some time, but in terms of the lucid culture and the, and the lucid networks that come into place where the manager is not the hub and the soul of everything, but you have opinion leaders, you have uh, uh, non-structured but very powerful people in the system who can actually play that supporting role in creating a conducive culture around. I think that's a wonderful point. Uh, and the other thing that also struck me very well, you know, which is authentic leadership, uh, you know, consciously playing the empathy card, you know, and, and showing their vulnerable side because the trust bonding which comes around, it's like an umbilical cord, you know, which once is identified, pulls people together uh, in a cohesive uh, cohort. I think that's uh, both points very well made. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> you know, the other thing that we are looking at today is uh, thanks to the pandemic, as well as everything else that's happening around us, uh, we've done to death these topics about, you know, the new forms of workplace, uh, whether it's going to be a hybrid workplace tomorrow, whether there's going to be more people staying at home and working out of home. Uh, my point is, are we looking at the toxicity which sometimes affects a workplace also having a spiraling effect now that we are also talking about large number of homes becoming a, an active center for work and in that case what role do we as hr professionals and as heads of hr as well as conscious organizations have to create a conducive environment or let's put it a work ready home for instance whereby that same uh, uh, you know employee can be provided with certain amount of support so that he doesn't become, or he doesn't get engulfed into that spiraling mode of toxicity. 
um, how would you look at that? No, I think it's a great question and uh, context <laughs> to the times we are in. Um, I would say, Devjani, I, you know, the basic support which one can provide, which is infrastructure support and all, I wouldn't get there because all of us need to. None of us know where the future will go. Yes. But we do know that it will be different than what the past was. Yeah. And one of the things which we have learned very well is that despite a uh, pandemic hitting us, a large part of office related work or technology intensive work could actually be done from home. Hmm. Now, if that's a learning and we know a sizable part of the population could continue to stay uh, and work from home, um, toxicity, which is uh, very natural, like it happens at workplace, it will happen here as well. There are informal groups in pantries which create positivity. They also create negativities and people have different ways and forms of them. Yeah. I would say just maybe two or three diff ideas which are uh, different. One is we've got to realize that people who play an important role in this, uh, this entire transition are frontline leaders. Uh, most of our frontline leaders struggle with new ways of working. How do we really help them understand? And I'll just give a couple of examples. Like we just had a leadership meeting with uh, our India leadership team just last two days. And one of the topics we talked about was wellness. And we were struggling because, you know, wellness is such a broad topic. Should we invite a speaker? What do we really do in that? Uh, and we ended up actually doing a very simple exercise where we actually had a small cohort of people who came together and divided everyone into those small cohorts and talked about what are their stressors and how do they react to stress. And the second question we asked them is to share, uh, you know, when that happens, what do you do, do, do to deal with stress? And that small conversation where like I shared with everyone that when I'm stressed out, you can see it on my face, it's quite visible. Uh, my way of dealing with it is to go for a run or to play with my son, right, our own ways. But having that conversation with some of your peers was so uplifting Absolutely. because what it does is it brings in an element of sensitivity that these small things are impactful and can really help us mm. create the right environment. Mm. And how these all these leaders were so excited about doing a similar conversation with their team that it can create a tremendous upliftment in the organization. So I think, you know, focusing on people managers, that's the one. Second, making sure we're listening to employees. A lot of us as leaders stop listening in a situation like this. You're not traveling, you're not meeting people. Mm -hmm. uh, the only forum you are in are formal reviews or direct one-on-one -on -one conversation related to a topic. But how do we create space, which is just about listening. It's not about defending, sharing strategy, doing a review, but just listening to a set of people. And once you have done that over a period of time, and a few of you as leaders have done, Bring that learning together and see what are, what trends are we seeing in the organization, what should be done different. Mm -hmm. And for us in the last six months, one of the things which I relearned was that there was a tremendous stress because of video calls. So how do you reduce that? We came up with no Wednesday video calls and so on. So empower your leaders and then listen to the people on the ground so that you can make the right changes. I, th I think that again shows us how uh, humane HR can get and the leadership role in, in such difficult situations where not only do you get down to the level of every human being working in the environment and looking at the picture from their angle, but you're actually uh, looking at psychological isolation, which is such an important factor in our lives today. Um, uh, honestly, if you ask me, even I used to love the fact of walking over to a vending machine, picking up a cup of coffee and probably indulging three, four sentences just for the sake of it. You know, it was quite a breather. Um, uh, and I really miss that. Okay, work from home is not something which is really, um, uh, I mean, something that can rejuvenate you or nurture your professional and social side the way the office space used to. And um, a lot of examples coming through um, in my network is says that work from home has its downsides. If not nurtured well, if not reached out, if not communicated to properly and at regular intervals. And that also puts its own pressures on leadership styles. Because leadership as it was yesterday is probably not the need of leadership today. It has to empathize. It has to become much more empathic. And uh, uh, those are the things which probably will help to narrow down that psychological isolation in the minds of people. Um, and how do you look at that? I mean, what does psychological isolation ring a bell in your mind? Uh, or is it something you haven't encountered yet? No, 
you are right, Devjani. It's one of the areas I am actually most worried about as I look into the future of our organization. Because what this situation did was just almost ripped apart the social connection, and which is such a fundamental need all of us have. Like you, so uh, people in my office say, where is Arif? Because I'm really at the place where I'm supposed to work because my point is I'm there only to check my emails. But if I'm in a meeting, I'll be with people or I'll be on the floor meeting people, right? It's so naturally. It's so natural for us, yeah. Yeah. So um, I think it's it's an area we should be conscious. And as we look at wellness as a whole, social needs is a very important facet to it. Um, unfortunately, since the traditional or what we used to do in past roots have gone away, we have to figure out ways to create needs. Yes. And again, um, some somebody taught me. So our supply leader, he did, uh, who heads heads the entire manufacturing for all the plants. Um, what he did towards the end of the year, he actually invited everyone, all of his plant managers, to join with family, and they they talked about as uh, couples uh, how they met, how did they get married, what has happened in their life after that. They also shared things like you know somebody sang a song, somebody. Uh, played a musical instrument and so on. They actually had that event for three hours. Mm. And uh, post that, they came back and said, we have never connected as people like this in the past. So yes, there are channels which are broken. But if one wants, one can create those connections. As in, um, we, he was telling me, his name is Sanjeev, awesome guy. And Sanjeev was telling me, Arif, I could never imagine if this had not happened. Yeah. If I had actually met all the plant managers with their spouses, spouses, yeah, heard their stories of, you know, how they met, how they got married, and just those personal connections, which just doesn't happen. Yes. So one can create, and one should create. Otherwise, it will, to your point, have a huge impact in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And and uh, you know, the last thing that I I want to bring to the table before you is, uh, workforce management will never be the same again. Uh, you know, irrespective of. Um, uh, whether we hypothecate, is it going to be 60% work from home? Is it going to be 40%? What's the ratio going to be? Is it going to be a hybrid model? As you rightly said a little while back, we still don't know what the future holds for us. And we are still innovating. We are still sort of, uh, you know, looking at options available to us. But one thing which is very clear is the traditional workforce is going to be replaced by a lot of new animals around the block. So you have the gig workers, you have the temp workers, you have the subject matter specialists who's going to come to you and you're going to be bid for him with an auction price, you know. Uh, and you also have the digital nomads, those fantastic uh, creatures who, who work out, uh, you know, support factors in a jiffy and who, who put in solutions in your uh, IT mechanisms in a jiffy and you don't know where it comes from. So this is a different world we are walking into in terms of workforce management. Uh, we we're talking about toxicity. We're talking about creating a healthy uh, culture and a workplace as against that toxicity that we don't want to bring into our workplaces. With this new form of people coming and joining us, um, it's going to be another set of melting pots. The organization will have to undergo a catharsis of its own. Um, what would you say uh, should be, at least proactively, our lookout to make sure that we handle this new catharsis in a different way and we are able to you know, manage this new influx uh, in ways that is going to be steady state for us and not lead to further toxicity as we would not like it to be. So um, I'll just say a couple of things. First of all, Devjan, you're right. All this is going to be a reality. You know, gig workers or more part-time workers focused on assignments. Um, not um, everyone will not be a permanent worker. That's the shape of the workforce will change. And I think it's a great opportunity for us to figure out what opportunity exists for us to leverage that. Now, it can't change for all kinds of jobs across all industries, right? But it will be relevant for certain certain jobs. It will definitely become more impactful for certain organizations. So we should figure out, and the best way I, I have learned to really drive a change is to try out in a small scale, learn from that, and scale it up. But when it comes to toxicity and the culture, I think there are certain principles which will stay fundamental to whatever the new composition of the workforces or the structure or the hardware itself. I think it, one is about leaders' role model. Uh, if there are certain uh, values we hold high and a culture which we aspire for, if the leaders are not role models of that culture, there is no way we can really create that environment and build that. 
The other thing is, one can say all the nice things, but what really happens in the organization? So who gets promoted? If you are saying that we want to build a culture which engages all kinds of people, is highly inclusive, it's about growing people, it's about uh, you know taking new pets, being more innovative. But if you're going to promote a person who's the most conservative of the lot and just focused on his or her operational metrics, everyone sees that. Absolutely. And create the right culture. It's about who who gets incentive and what kind of incentive to reinforce those behaviors and so on. It's about when we are out there in a town hall, what are we saying? We are saying that you've got to be most creative to the same point, right? Innovative, future-looking organization. Absolutely. But the only conversation we are happening, we are having in that town hall is the operational performance of the quarter and what went well, what did not go well and stop the conversation there. You cannot change the culture or build the right culture. So I would say, yes, these are new opportunities we should leverage. But I think fundamental principles about leaders' role modeling, about what we encourage, recognize, how we grow and develop people, how do we make it more visible, they mm-hmm. still not good. They will uh, not go away. I, I think that's the nail in the coffin. You've hit that. Um, everything said and done. Um, the leadership paradigm, um, looking at participative management, okay, making sure that it's not all top-driven, but also bottoms up and we are there to listen. Um, I heard you say very well that managers and leaders should start listening to people very carefully in these areas of and, and times of strife. Um, and that's obviously much more relevant, especially when toxicity comes in. Because I think half the problems in organizations become uh, large issues because we don't have the time to, to have the patience to listen to people. That'll, that'll actually be half the battle won, uh, is, is the way I look at it. So I think um, uh, it's wonderful our views resonate around these uh, particular issues. And, and why not? Because we, we are working at the same milieu. We're facing the same issues. It can't be radically different and it can't change overnight. Um, uh, having said that, I think it's been wonderful. It's, it's, it's a pleasure uh, discussing because sometimes we as individual CHROs keep doing a lot of stuff. But when we hear the same being resonated across, you know, it just makes the whole purpose and uh, uh, moment that much more meaningful. Thank you, Arif. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. Likewise, Devjani, it's been a pleasure as in um, some of these themes are so relevant for all of us. I think we should, um, like you said, share more and grow with each other versus, you know, this is not a field of competition. This is about- Absolutely. Absolutely. No, it's, it's like drawing strength from each other. And I honestly thank uh, Economic Times for giving, giving us this platform today. Great. Wonderful talking to you. Thank you. Same here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Aziz and Mr. Roy, for sharing your inputs. Stay tuned and keep tweeting using the hashtag ETHRNextTech. We have a short networking break. You can visit the exhibit hall and see our partner's booth for useful assets, videos, and presentations.